belt. Uh, but tonight, we are very happy to have with us Brad Meltzer and Judd Winnick. Brad, thank you. And, and before I go any further, I'd just like to say I'm sorry it's so hot in this room. You know, when Brad comes and, and Judd comes, you can always expect this kind of turnout here in the room, so it gets a little warm. But I heard uh, from the Weather Channel we're getting a big cold front tomorrow. It's going down to 97 degrees, so we don't have to worry about that. Brad, Brad Meltzer is the author of the number one New York Times bestsellers, The Inner Circle, The Book of Fate, and six other best-selling thrillers. His nonfiction books, Heroes for My Soul and Heroes for My Daughter, were also New York Times bestsellers. He's the host of the History Channel series, Brad Meltzer's Decoded, and the Eisner Award-winning writer of Justice League of America. A graduate of the University of Michigan and Columbia Law School, you can find out much more about him at bradmeltzer.com. You can also see what he's doing right now on Facebook and Twitter. Judd Winnick grew up on Long Island where he spent countless hours doodling, reading X-Men comics, and the newspaper strip Bloom County, and watching Looney Tunes. When Judd isn't collecting far more action figures and vinyl toys than a normal adult, he's a screenwriter and award-winning cartoonist. Judd has scripted issues of the best-selling comic series including Batman, Green Lantern, Green Arrow, Justice League, and Star Wars, and has been the head writer on the Hulu Network's animated series The Awesomes. Judd is the author of the highly acclaimed graphic novel, Pedro and Me, about his real-world roommate and friend, AIDS activist, Pedro Zamora. You can visit Judd and Hilo online at juddwinnick.com. Please, let's give him a Books and Books welcome, Brad Meltzer and Judd Winnick. have one mic between the two. Yeah, we're going to so. do, yeah, you want to start first and I'll, and I'll go do my thing? Um, you want to no. say hello? I'm starting. Brad's going to go first. Get okay, I'm going to go. Here we go. I'm going to come over here and watch. Okay, Judd's going to watch. Here we go. So, a couple things. One, there is no way that any place in America has a hotter room than here right now, right? <laughs> Can we know? Can we have, I mean, first, so, um, most important thank you goes to Mitchell Kaplan and everyone at Books and Books. We love this place, right? Let's hear it for Mitch. I will say it once, and it, it bears repeating tonight, because um, there's so many people that I know from this area, but when I first started writing, uh, the Barnes & Noble in Aventura, we asked them to do an event, and they said, we don't want to host an event for you, and this guy named Mitch Kaplan said, well, I would love to host an event for you, for you, Brad, the unknown writer. And we had our first event here, and, um, and then, of course, the Barnes & Noble in Aventura said, uh, we'd love to host an event for you, and we never went, and now that store is closed, and now here we are tonight. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I love Barnes & Noble, they've been great to me, um, but that one person at the Aventura one was a curse on that Aventura store, <laughs> and um, I love Mitchell because he took a chance on me at the very first, uh, very first book before chapter one, he was right there, so I love you for it, you know it. And for me, um, I also have to thank there, I never get to do this. I was in Atlanta yesterday in North Carolina two days before, and there were like two Jews there, no minion. Um, <laughs> that joke did not work in North Carolina either, <laughs> I can tell you right now. And you do a minion joke, right, it would work in North Carolina. <laughs> Didn't work in Georgia either, only in Buckhead. And so, right, all the Jews here are like, I know where Buckhead is, I know. We could do the synagogue tour. So. I want to thank my family, and my family is here, and Bobby and Dale are here, and Amy and Matt are here, and my sons uh, are here. I never, I always get to thank my sons, I always get to thank my wife. I don't get to thank my niece and my nephews who are also here tonight, and I appreciate them being here. We love you. <laughs> and um, and I love, uh, I'll talk about Jonas and, and Theo after, but uh, my wife, I love you, Corey, and for being here tonight. And I'm going to talk about Judd after. So let's start a little bit with I Am Helen Keller. And very quickly, um, when we started this book, it was very important to me that what we wanted were better heroes for our kids. That's where the whole process started. And we started with I Am Amelia Earhart, we started with Ab I Am Abraham Lincoln, and we've done all these other books since. And the only thing we really need, perfecto, thank you. And the only thing, when we started, was like, who else are we going to do? And the one person who we knew was always on the list was Helen Keller. But when we started the book, when every book is written, what Chris Eliopoulos does, he's our amazing artist, who you can see his work right there, he has to draw the cover before he ever reads the book, because the cover has to be done six months before to make sure it makes the catalog. So Chris usually draws four pictures 
And then we usually pick one of them and we kind of say, you know, a little bit more like this one in the right-hand corner and the left-hand corner. And Chris drew four pictures for this. And we said, no, that's not good. And he drew another four. And now we're driving him crazy. And we said, he said, well, tell me about her. Tell me what the book's about. And I said, here's the thing about Helen Keller. When you look at pictures of Helen Keller in your, when, in your mind, when you think about her, everyone always kind of pictured this, this sad, forlorn, she's looking down, she's at the well, she's got her hands in the water, but she's looking real, like she's pitied. We should pity her because she's blind and because she's deaf. And when I read about her, and, I read, and when I read her writing, what I realized was she used to go outside and run through the grass. She used to ride a horse, blind and deaf, riding a horse. She said she loved being outside because when she was outside, she could feel the sun on her face. She could smell the flowers that she couldn't see. Outside, she was alive. And Chris wrote back one word. He goes, I get it, exuberant. And then he drew this cover, exactly like that. Um, and I will tell you, there is, I can, I've never told anyone, but there is a secret in the grass. If you look in the grass, there's a hidden word in there, and I'll leave it to you to find it. But we, hit a, we even hit a little code in the front cover, which he put there right from the first drawing. Don't look now, you're never gonna find it, I promise. <laughs> I promise, you're never you're gonna need to cover yourself. That's the way how I get you to buy the book and see it up close. So, but when he drew this, this was the redefinition of Helen Keller for us. We're gonna show people how amazing she was, how alive she was, and we went to the American Foundation for the Blind, Helen Keller's organization that she founded all those years ago. And I explained to them what we wanted to do. We wanted to redefine Helen Keller for a new generation, and I explained to them what I saw, I explained to them how I perceived her, and it's a terrifying moment because you have no idea how they perceive her. And she, the woman said to me, we love it, that's exactly how we see her. And so I'm gonna just walk you very quickly through I am Helen Keller. Um, somehow on here, there should be a, we go on here. If we can go forward on one. This one's not working. You'll tell me how to do it, hold on. <laughs> Okay, great, perfect. So, again, exuberance right at the start. Here's the thing I want you to do, because I want you to have the experience. What I love about this book is that you can actually share the experience that Helen Keller has in a very small way. So when you get to the part where she goes blind, the pages go black. Close your eyes, everyone in this room, close your eyes, right? And it says, this is how I see the world. Cover your ears, this is how I hear the world, right? Now cover your ears, this is it. This is the Helen Keller experience. Now you can open your eyes, open your ears. What I also love is we can share what, what Helen Keller, when she's younger, her parents, everyone tells her parents, get rid of her, put her in an institution. This girl's gonna amount to nothing. What it, they instead do is instead of getting her an institution, they get her a teacher. And this is Helen Keller with Ann Sullivan, her teacher. And you'll see why this becomes important. And when you'll see when Helen Keller learns how to read, it's not just that we show Braille. When you read the book, there's real Braille in the book. And it says right there, it says, feel these dots, this is my name. My name is Helen. What's your name? And on the opposite page, you can find the Braille alphabet. And I knew we were onto something here. My son, who sits in the back, once said to me, I hate to read. And I said, you do know what I do for a living, right? <laughs> you do know what pays the bills. This is Joe, no, Jonas, don't look at your younger brother. This is you I'm talking about. <laughs> He's looking at the younger brother. No, it's my 13-year-old. He's like, and, but I will say, my 13-year-old said to me with this book, he said, can I read the Helen Keller book? And I said, sure. It was the first book he ever asked me to read himself. And he's obviously older than the demographic is, but he knows that I write these books for him, for my daughter, for my younger son. And he finished the book, and I saw him. He didn't know I was watching, but I saw him feeling those dots, closing his eyes, trying to find his name in the alphabet. And when he was done, he said, Dad, this is a good one. This is the one. And I knew there was something special, and, and because of the way Chris drew it, because of the way we could interact with the audience. And one of the things that we get to do is uh, I'll share, and I want to keep this quick so Judd and I can answer questions, but is I want to also leave you with these two stories. One is Helen Keller's definition of love. And what she says, when Helen Keller wanted to learn something, Ann Sullivan, her teacher, used to have to write the words in her hand, would sign the letters so she could feel what she was saying. But Helen Keller could only learn a word by touching it. So if she wanted to learn the word book, she would touch a book, and she knows that's a book. Touch a chair, you know that's a chair. But one time, Ann Sullivan signs to her, I love Helen. And Helen says, what's love? She can't feel love, can't touch it. And Ann Sullivan says to her, 
Love is like a cloud. It's like a cloud. You'll never touch a cloud. You can't touch a cloud, but you can feel its rain. You can feel the happiness that a, that a flower feels when it's watered. And that's what love is. You're never going to touch it, but you can feel it. And Helen Keller says in that moment, it's almost like these invisible lines spread out from her, and she suddenly feels connected to all those she loves. And there's Helen Keller's feeling of love. That is, to me, the greatest definition of love I've ever heard. And the reason it's so important, um, when, I, when I worked on this book, and I'll leave you with this, is this book is dedicated to my English teacher, Ms. Sheila Spicer. That's her. <laughs> in case you're confused, that is not me in ninth grade. Um, but Ms. Spicer was a teacher who changed my life. And this book, obviously, is about teachers. It's about Ann Sullivan, who was the, one of the greatest teachers of all time to Helen Keller. And I never get to tell this story, but I get to tell it now. And it's so appropriate I get to tell it here because this happened only a few miles from here. And two years ago, I dedicated a book to my history teacher, Ellen Sherman. And my 11th grade history teacher changed my life also, along with Miss Spicer. Took a chance on me. I write history books about kids for kids. I write thrillers that are filled with history. I have two shows that air on the History Channel. I owe my history teacher, right? You owe her. And I dedicate a book to her, and she says to me, uh, she gets in contact with me. We email back and forth, and she finally says to me, Brad, I have something I want to ask you, and I feel really uncomfortable about it. And I'm like, uh-oh, what's this? And she said, here's the thing. I'm dying. I'm sick. My kidneys are failing. And I'm wondering, I see you have all these people on your Facebook page. Could you help me find potentially a match and a new kidney donor? Yes, I think I can do a Facebook post for you, the teacher who changed my life, right? So we put a Facebook post up there. And amazingly, we get all these volunteers, strangers who are willing to donate. And this one woman do says she's going to donate. She actually is a match. It's like the odds are crazy. She's an actual match for my teacher. And they fly her down here to see if she, the other parts of it, they want to do a biopsy. They have to check her kidney. She's here at Jackson right here. And a couple weeks go by, I'm like, how'd it go? And she emails me, she says, I have some news for you. When they brought me down, this is the donor. When they brought me down and they did the biopsy on my kidney, they realized that I found, they found an early cancer on my own kidney. And because they caught it so early, thank you, Brad, for saving my life. And I said, I didn't save your life at all. You saved your own life, right? You saved your own life by being so kind to my teacher. So then we t put this out again to Facebook. We now have about 100,000 people on Facebook, I said, listen to the universe, people. This one woman had this incredible experience. Is there anyone else out there who might want to donate their kidney? And again, all these people volunteer who want to give their body parts to complete strangers. And this one woman, Amy, emails me. She says, hey, Brad, you know, um, I emailed them, uh, your teacher, and I, I, she, I never heard back, and I'm worried that my email slipped through the cracks. And my first thought was, it didn't slip through the cracks. Like, she's busy. They're going to get to you. Don't worry. But for God knows what reason, I said, you know what? I take her email, I send it to Mrs. Sherman, and I say, listen, there's one person who might have slipped through the cracks. Just take a look at this woman. And a couple weeks later, they email me back, and they're like, that woman Amy you sent us? I say, yeah, she's the match. The great part is they checked two weeks ago, and her email, they didn't know where it ever went. It went to spam. It would have been lost forever. They actually finally found it. They said it was gone. We don't even know why. And the great part was, and I brought it here because I never get to really show it, this happened two weeks ago. This is Mrs. Sherman and Amy. And my favorite, my favorite part of this is that, and, and this is, I mean, it was unbelievable to me. This is two weeks ago. Now, the last page of this book of I Am Helen Keller ends with this one page. It says, go thank the teacher who changed your life, which is how all of this started. And I realized in that moment, OK, that, this book comes out four days after this surgery. Like either that is just divine intervention or I am the greatest marketing expert of all time. <laughs> and I just want to announce here now, I promise for next book we are doing open heart surgery on someone. <laughs> I don't know who it's going to be, the lucky winner, but we're going to be doing it. Um, and then I'll leave you. We're doing I Am Martin Luther King Jr. in January. And then very few people have seen this. We finally do next year, George Washington. So. I want to now do what is far more important than me rambling on. I want to introduce, um, I, I have to take a moment here. And I'll tell you this. I was doing the math today. I think it was 23, 24, depending on where you count from, if you count right, the year when we started. Uh, <laughs> my freshman year, 
<laughs> at the University of Michigan. That's right. I'll never forget it. And I never get to do this. I never right. get to do this. So I'm taking time. Well, you uh, like I remember this kid walks in to my room and he's wearing, I remember what he's wearing. He's wearing the jean jacket because it's the 80s and 90s. <laughs> And he's painted on the back of the jean jacket. I've never seen anything like it before, but he has all these cartoon pictures on it. And I'm like, and, we, and he notices on my wall that there are posters of Batman and Green Arrow and She-Hulk on my wall. I was a freshman, and I thought that was going to get me girls, OK? <laughs> like everyone else had beer posters with women with their boobs hanging out. Like I had superheroes. Not exactly the magnet you hope it's going to be. But what it brings me is my friend Judd Winnick. And we quickly connect and very quickly find we both love comics. Now, here's the part. I've told that part of the story before. But here's the part I never get to tell, ever. And that is, I remember right there that day. I remember it. I remember him saying the words. I don't even think he knows it. But you have that when you meet someone, you say, oh, what are you studying? What do you want to do? And I remember, I don't know if I said, what do you want to be or what are you studying? But he said, when I grow up, I want to be a cartoonist. And I remember thinking, this kid's crazy. Like, that's not a job, <laughs> right? Because writing's not a job. And it was the first time in my entire life I had Miss Spicer to thank. I had Miss Sherman to give me a love of history. So my English teacher's great. But I never, ever once considered writing as a job until I met Judd. Because he came fully formed to college and knew what he wanted to be when he grew up. And I was like, oh my gosh, you could be that? Someone will pay you to do that? It was the first time I realized that all those cartoons you see, those comic strips you see, Garfield, Family Circus, you know, Calvin Hobbes, Bloom County, those great ones we loved, that someone was paying someone to do that. And that was a light bulb for me, right? There it was. Suddenly you can be an artist. Holy cow, that's a job I never thought of. So Judd is my best friend from college. In fact, my first published work ever is this book. It is Judd's book. He was the official cartoonist for the University of Michigan. And at the end, we were like, you know what? You got to have a book. And you got to have your comic strips put together. Now, back then, you know, now you can make a, your book all you want. This was, you know, Nuts and Bolts was the name of a strip. And I dug it out. And what I love about it is, like, and I remember when we made this, it's, it's watching the spin cycle. And it says, with an introduction by Brad Meltzer. And I wrote the intro. Why? Because I was the publisher. Right? And we sold this book to the independent bookstore that was on State Street at the University of Michigan. It was a little store called Borders. They had one of them. Okay? That dates us, right? And I walked into Borders with a bunch of copies and said, will you buy some? And I remember they took like 10 or 20. I don't even remember what it was anymore. And I remember thinking, like, they're going to sell them. And they sold them. We sold them all over. I have my final copies. I dug it out today. I know exactly where it was. I knew he was coming. Um, and this is the very first time in almost 25 years that Judd and I have ever got to do an event together. We've shared every book I write. I can thank Judd. He's in every acknowledgments because he reads the early copies. He's the one who, in the very beginning, we lived together and I got all my rejection letters. I was living with Judd. Whenever I did anything that it comes to, when it comes to writing, I thank this man. I owe him forever. Um, bastards. Um, and uh, he changed my life. And I get to finally, finally, 20-something years later, you know I love history, I finally get to say thank you publicly. I love you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, meet Judd Winnick. Love it. Have fun. Thank you. OK. Uh, I should just walk off now. Um, thank you, Bradley. Um, I can start saying a few things, Brad, but I don't think I'll, I'll get through the talk. Um, all right. So there will be no discussion of giving people kidneys. And um, if I start talking about Brad directly, I don't think I'll, I'll make it through. So uh, thank you all. I will say this, that. Um, None of my actual family that one refers to as family is uh, here tonight. But uh, um, I've got Joyce Elias right here, who's a member of my family. I've got the Meltzers and the Flams, and I have the Zamoras. So when I come to Florida, like every good Jew, you've got people. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to dive into this. Uh, hopefully this, this works. 
So I'm just going gonna, gonna to dive into it. I'm going to talk about um, just kind of the story of how I came up with my book, Hilo and stuff. So it's the story about how I came up with you know, my book, Hilo and stuff. <laughs> um, so we've got to go way back. When I was a kid, long ago, when you know, dinosaurs roamed the earth, <laughs> and I was a geeky kid. I was a kid who, hey, if the little ones can't see, I'll count to 10. You guys can come. Every little guy who can't see, you want to come up in front? Come on, let's go. Let's do it. Let's do it. Because the guys who are streaming this on TV, this is like the best part right now. There's the guy standing here with the sound of children like... Okay, so this is the best in the whole world right here. All right. Pop a squat. Let's go, let's go, let's go. All right. So... So when I was a kid, I was a geeky kid. I like geeky things. I like Star Wars. I like Looney Tunes cartoons. I like monster movies. Monster movies, not horror movies, not the scary kind. Just, just guys in big stupid rubber suits like Godzilla and Gamera, and especially King Kong. I loved King Kong. I loved King Kong in kind of an unnatural way. Um, <laughs> I also like to draw. I used to draw all the time. And I was lucky enough that my mom and dad always supported just that. They would let me draw as much as I want. So I spent most of my childhood sitting in front of the TV, watching Looney Tunes, Star Wars, and monster movies, and drawing. That was pretty much my gig. I loved drawing King Kong. And I would draw him over and over again. Um, do you guys know the story of King Kong? I'm talking to the guys here. They don't. OK. So King Kong, but kids in the back know. King Kong is like, he's about a 75-foot giant gorilla. He lives on a prehistoric island called Skull Island. And then this expedition, they come to the island, they capture him, they bring him back to New York City, and they're going to put on a big show. He escapes, he runs amok, because only King Kong runs amok. Does anything else run amok? So King Kong runs amok, and he climbs the Empire State Building. This is important. So as a kid, I used to like to draw King Kong a lot. I would draw. The same drawing, though. It was, the em it was start with the Empire State Building, and then I would add all the windows, I mean like every single one, <laughs> tediously, until I got the entire Empire State Building drawn. And then finally, I'd add King Kong at the top <laughs> and the airplanes. The thing is, I didn't really like drawing the whole building and all the windows. I just really wanted to draw King Kong at the top. But I, for some reason, thought I had to draw the whole building. All I really wanted to do is this part. I don't know why. And I would do this drawing over and over and over again. So anyway. Little Jug got a little bit bigger, a little bit older. I found some other interests besides monster movies and Looney Tunes. I like funny cartoons, like Mad Magazine and Crack Magazine and Crazy. I also liked the funnies, comic strips. I like them a lot. Do you guys know what comic strips are? Yes, no. That's the thing. OK, so long ago, when I was a kid, when dinosaurs roamed the earth, there was this thing called newspapers, which were their, their iPads made of paper, which came to your house daily and had news in it. And most importantly, it had comic strips. And on Sundays, they had them in color. And I loved them. I loved them because they were cartoons that were funny. And I wasn't even really aware of it at the time because I just took it for granted. They came to your house every day. Every day the newspaper showed up and there was two or three pages of funnies. And it was the best. And I loved it. It, it, was, it was also because it, it felt like that's the kind of stuff I want to do. So I started drawing funny pictures. There's a cat. That's what a cat actually looks like. And I realized early on, I don't draw like that. I draw like this. This is what a cartoon cat looks like. That's Garfield. It doesn't really look like a real cat. I knew I could draw goofy and silly. I couldn't draw realistically. So I realized that that's the kind of way I draw, like a cartoonist. And so I started doing funny drawings. And that's my mom and dad, my first audience, who thought it was pretty funny. And that's where it clicked. I want to do comic strips. That's what I want to do with my life. I want to make a comic strip that comes to everybody's house every single day. I thought that would be awesome. 
I also liked superhero comics. Straight up superhero comics. I dug the X-Men, and I liked Fantastic Four, and I liked Batman, and it wasn't anything really like comic strips. I, I just kind of liked, I liked the action of it. I liked the fact that people had superpowers and there were villains, Ooh, and they were never funny though. It was different. They were big stories and they were adventure stories and there were lots of fights and there was lots of science fiction and there was the Hulk, who I liked a lot because the Hulk is awesome. But I couldn't draw like that. I still can't draw like this. This is comic books. I draw goofy, but I love to read them and they were very much a part of my life. So little Judd gets a little older, a little less turf up top, and I got lucky. I got to do a lot of different stuff. I got to do a comic strip called Front of the Clown. I got to do this animated series called Life and Times of Juniper Lee for Cartoon Network. And I got to write superhero comics. I got to write Batman. I got to write this X-Men comic called Exiles. But I never got to do the Hulk, even though the Hulk's awesome. So I never got a chance to do that. So one day, about three years ago, my son asks me. He says, Dad. I say, yeah. He says, Dad. Can I read some of your comic books, your superhero comics? Can I read Batman? And I told him, no. <laughs> no, you may not. Because Batman's kind of made for like older kids and grown-ups, not for like a seven-year-old. You know, particularly my run on Batman. It's not like, well, it's kind of intense. You know, it's, it's, I was about to say it's not very violent, but you wouldn't know from this picnic picture over here. But for like a little guy, it's kind of it felt like a bit much. So I, we went out and tried to find him a comic book for kids. And the one we landed on was one called Bone. This is Jeff Smith's Bone. If any of you guys have not read Bone, you should go read Bone. You should get one tonight and take it home with you. So my son started to read Bone. There's nine volumes of them. He read all nine of them, and he loved it. I'm lucky enough that I actually know Jeff Smith, who's the cartoonist on Bone. Told Jeff, my son loves Bone. He says, great. He sends me posters and hats and action figures and stuffed animals, and my son became a Bone super fan. Like, not a little, like a lot. And this bothered me. <laughs> because, you know, I love Jeff and I love Bone, but my son apparently liked Jeff and Bone a little more than I felt comfortable with. And I'm a cartoonist. I should be able to tell a story like this. I really felt I should be able to kind of elicit this reaction out of my son. So I sat down and started thinking about what would be the kind of story I could do for my son. But what I was running into is that I wanted, he wanted a superhero story. He wanted an action adventure. But I don't do it like that. You know, I started thinking about, like, I draw goofy pictures, and I like to make jokes. But I also can tell these adventure stories. So what can I do? So I put both those ideas in a blender, and out came Hilo. So Hilo is a goofy looking action adventure with a lot of laughs, which kind of feels like a superhero story. It's, you know, got a kid with superpowers, things blow up, there's giant robots, but it's also pretty silly. It's like a comic strip in that way. It looks like a comic strip and it's kind of goofy. Even the action stuff is a little bit silly, you know? And it, uh, it's got an ongoing mystery, which we will slowly solve. And it has at least one raccoon. <laughs> So this is Hilo, and we're going to tell this story uh, over six books. Each of the books is one big chapter, and by the time I'm done, you get to see this whole big story of Hilo, and I love it. I love doing it. So right before I started this book tour, which I say this like, you know, this is like two weeks ago, um, <laughs> I was trying to think about what I want to tell you guys and what I want to talk about, and it occurred to me that Hilo is a lot like my King Kong drawing. You know, the drawing where I was talking about, like where I draw the entire building and all the windows, and then I put King Kong atop. For a long time, I've been drawing the building. All this stuff I've been doing, it's just I've been drawing this building and putting in all the windows, when I think I just, I just wanted to do King Kong atop. And I think Hilo's my King Kong atop. For a long time, I've been telling, try, trying to figure out where I want to go and how I want to tell these stories, and I think this is it. Now I just can do it without the building. So one more big thing. So 21 years ago, I was on the real world San Francisco. I'm going to have to explain. <laughs> 21 years ago, yes. Some of the grown-ups gasp and say, like, I remember watching that. That was not 21 years ago. 
for you guys, that, okay, the kids are confused. I gotta explain real quick. So, <laughs> do you know what reality TV is? It's the one where they don't, like, there's not actors, they just film people being people. Okay, so 21 years ago, I was on a show called The Real World, where it takes seven people from around the country, put them up in a house for six months, and film them all the time, and they make a TV show. So, one of my housemates was a young man named Pedro Zamora. And in this picture, there's that beautiful woman on one side, and that's me behind her, and that's Pedro. The beautiful woman, her name is Pam. She would become my girlfriend, then my fiance, then my wife, and now the mother of our two children. That's, well, thank you. That's a whole other story. Um, Pedro, uh, Pedro Zamora was an AIDS educator and activist, and he was also living with AIDS. And not long after we finished filming the show, Pedro passed away. And after he died, we, my, my wife Pam and I, we went around the country and started talking to people about Pedro, particularly kids. We would go to middle schools and high schools and colleges and we talked about Pedro. And then after about a year, it kind of became too hard to do that. But years later, I was still stuck with the idea that I really wanted people to know about Pedro. I just didn't know how to do that. And that's when I thought of, I should probably try to tell a story the only way I know how. So I did a book about him called Pedro and Meg. And it was simply that. It was the story of who Pedro was before the show, what it was like for him to do the show, what my life was before we, we did the show, and what was it like for us to be friends, and what it was like to lose him. And I would never have done that if I hadn't known him. I would never have told this book or decided to tell the story in this way if I hadn't known him. He inspired me. Thank you, Joshua. Thank you, Millie. So this is my son, and um, I'm going to do it quick so I don't lose it completely. Um, I'm telling this story because he asked me to read some of my stuff, and I had nothing for him. So once again, I've kind of come full circle here. My son wanted a book, and I was able to do it for him. I thought Pedro needed a story to be told, so I did it for him. It is something that I'm very, very much aware of. and. When I do things from an honest place, they actually mean the most to me, and they actually seem to be the thing that is important. So, Hilo for me is a lot of, in a lot of ways like telling that story of Pedro, except now I'm telling it for my son and for other kiddos. So, I've come full circle. Uh, as a kid, I would sit in front of the TV and draw uh, and draw stories and. Uh, you know, and just watch television. I still like, live like a 10 year old. I make up stories and I draw them and I watch MASH reruns on Netflix. This is, so I consider myself incredibly lucky. Once again, I feel in a lot of ways, I've come all the way around. And uh, Hilo is how I've come all the way around this time. So at the beginning and the end, uh, I actually haven't even told that last bit of the, the end of the story. Uh, about Pedro and Toby before. You guys are the first one to hear it. It's actually the first time I've actually said it out loud. It means the world to me that, uh, that the Meltzers and the Flams are here. It means the world to me that I get to tell this one in front of Bradley. It means the world to me that the Samores are here to tell, to, for, for you guys to know. I owe Pedro so much. I told that story the first time, and it actually gets me right here so I can tell more stories. And thank you, Bradley, for this actually wasn't supposed to be an evening until Bradley made it an evening and said, when you leave New York, you should come to Florida. And I said, okay. So, and uh, it means a lot to me and a lot to us we got to do this for you. So thank you guys. <laughs> okay. Okay. More crying than you would at a Holocaust sign. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Salman Rushdie had less crying. Yeah. Than um, For a couple of cartoon books. Right. Yeah. yeah. This is exactly We're going to see cartoon. the. It's, fun. it's funny. Crying. Bring the kids. It's going to be great. Let me tell you about Salman Rushdie. Salman Rushdie was a Right? Everyone needs a good question, and you can ask us about anything, whether it's real world or comics or anything else we're doing. Um, but I need to tell my personal Hilo story. 
which is um, my personal review. We, because, see, I have uh, the lucky thing of being Judd's friend is he sent me Hilo, it was probably two years ago now, I feel like. Over that, yeah. 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 And I gave it to my son, who famously I hate to read, and he read it in one sitting. And I gave it to my daughter, and she read it in one sitting. And I was like, and I called Judd, and I was like, this, this thing's going to, this is working. <laughs> like, it's working like nobody's business. And, um, and I knew from the start, uh, whether, you have, whether you have kids out there who are reluctant readers or anything, buy this book for them. And then I gave it, when it was done, uh, to my youngest son. So let's put him on the spot. So 10 out of 10, what do you give Hilo? If it, one being the worst, 10 being the best. 10, right? Nice. There's the review. It's going right on the back. 10 out of 10, Theo. Um, <laughs> but I can't say enough good things about this book, and I didn't want to say that until he introduced it to you. But trust me on this. Even as an adult, if you like comics, if you like a good story, read Hilo. That's my plug. Um, let's do questions. Next one. Go ahead. And you want to do the second part also? And, and for Judd. Okay. Okay, so yeah, we're going to go. So one, first question we're is. We're going to deep, geeky yes. comic book cuts right away. By the Thank way, you. I can always tell you the comic book guys are the first to ask the first question always. Yep. Right? That's what we do. We love us for it. So thank you for being the brave one. Um, question was, is how does it feel to work with, jo well, how is it to work with Joss Whedon when I was writing Buffy the Vampire Slayer? For those who didn't know, I worked, with Bu I worked on Buffy. And Joss is, um, did this little independent film called The Avengers. And um, <laughs> you might have seen it. And he basically e emailed me one day. He was putting together all the writers from Buffy, and he wanted some comic book writers with him to go do what was then season eight, the next season of the book, in comic book form. And I will tell you, I was terrified. But of course, I said yes immediately. And I, he said to us, when you do this, pick a favorite character. If you like Buffy and you want to do a Buffy story, let me know so I can slot you in into the order of things. If you like Xander, do that. Whatever you like, just tell us what you like. So most people, I didn't realize, I, everyone was sending him emails. I wound up sending him an entire two-page, single-spaced, like crazy long thing about how the entire Buffy universe works and why it works in a certain way and why things do the certain thing. And I wrote at the very end, like, I don't know if this is like fan fiction or not, and if you hate this, just delete it and never write me again, it's okay. And then an email popped back up, and it said, I like some of these things, I don't like some of these things, but um, you're going to write the penultimate story, and I'm going to wrap it up, and this is what we're going to do. And then I was even more terrified. Um, <laughs> but it was one of the most amazing experiences, and the only reason I did it was because I want to be better. I want to get it to, as a writer. I wanted to learn, and he's someone who does what I know I don't do naturally, which is tell character do that character work. And I realized that I was doing, I'm, I'm a, I feel like I'm a more natural plotter. That's why I write thrillers. But if I was being honest, I wasn't doing the character work I needed to. I was doing it my comic book work, but not elsewhere. And I needed to know, how do I bring it back in? How do I bring that to my books? And I felt like Joss would teach me that. And um, he's been just a sweetheart to me. And the last thing I left him with is I said, I'm doing this book for you, but I just need to, I, they announced Avengers. I said, you need to promise me I get Captain American Shield one day. That will be paid, people. That will <laughs> be paid. Uh, the question is about. Uh, yeah, you got to repeat it so they hear it. Yes. Live stream. Uh, uh, was, was that Jason Todd? Okay. It wasn't? Yeah. Okay. So the question was uh, how did I feel about creating uh, uh, the Red Hood, Jason Todd? Uh, how did the concept come about? Okay. So the question, I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna tell a bunch of people in the audience what the hell we're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> no, no clue. So you've heard of Batman. You've seen pictures. So uh, Batman's had uh, his sidekick is Robin. He's had a couple of Robins. So he had the second sidekick after the first one grew up because he did, and you, most of you don't know that. Uh, he had he was this kid Jason Todd who was kind of the bad Robin. He was a juvenile delinquent is the best way I could say it. And years ago when we were kids and reading comics. People disliked him so much, they actually uh, decided to possibly kill him off. They had this big issue where Joker beats him up. I'm going to keep it yep, you know, yep, simple. Yep. Uh, beats him up, and then the building blows up, and then the last page, they let you vote. There was two phone numbers. Call this number if you want Robin to, not, to die. Call this number if you want Robin to live. 
Yes. I kid you not, they did this 1983? Yeah. Yeah, something like later, that. Even later. Something like that, maybe even later. So they, of course, voted for him to die because right. people are people. And for <laughs> 20 years, this became sort of a, a seminal moment that, you know, Robin died and Batman was sort of tortured by this. And actually, this kind of ushered in the dark period of Batman that we know now. So when I started writing comics, my great idea is like, yeah, I want to bring him back to life and totally undo that. Is that okay? And um, they actually let me do that. Uh, and to, 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 cut, to cut to the chase, I uh, brought Jason Todd back to life. He became a villain called the Red Hood. And uh, the idea was basically sold to DC Comics because I told them the ending. In the very end, Jason Todd is confronting Batman with Joker strapped to a chair, and he wants to know not why didn't you save my life, but why didn't you kill Joker? Because he killed me. It was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, the characters, I, I, you know, I wrote this years ago and the character is still kicking around and uh, I am very proud of it. So there, done. We can, we can, thank you. Based on my run on Batman, they also did a directed DVD movie called Batman Under the Red Hood that none of you little guys should see. Again, it's for the older kids, the teenagers and grown-ups. Okay. Next question. I don't have my glasses on, you got a Theo. Yes, this one. Theo, what do you got? What? Theo wants to know what the next Hilo book is about. Well, for those who haven't read it, it um, the first one, I can't talk about it. I will say that it, uh, it, it ends in a cliffhanger, and it picks up right where we left off. <laughs> <laughs> and it comes out May 2016. Actually, every book's going to come out every nine months. Actually, I'm, I'm drawing book three right now, and I had to have a discussion with my children about what spoilers are. <laughs> it's like, friends at school are going to read this and you can't tell them. Like, okay, what can't we tell them? Anything. Like, can I tell them about book two? No, that's the point. You can't. Okay, hit with the next question. Okay, you, I'm gonna, you, you can't see? Okay, yes, yes. Do you write for any comics in any papers? Oh, okay, go ahead and do it. Uh, the question was, do I, do I do any comic strips? I do not. Uh, I did a comic strip called Frumpy the Clown for about three years. Available uh, nowhere except my house. <laughs> <laughs> this was Nuts and Bolts. It's my comic strip I did every day uh, in the Michigan Daily, uh, which seems like a lifetime ago, which then led to Frumpy the Clown, which I did as a syndicated comic strip for about three years. It was around that time when I was doing it, uh, it was after the real world, that um, I was also lecturing around the country about Pedro. And it was there that I, doing a comic strip didn't feel like it was enough. It actually felt like I, I wanted to tell a bigger story. Okay, I'm gonna find, I'm find him. Yes. What did uh, what did it feel to write uh, the uh, Identity Crisis, uh, the, the Justice League, uh, <laughs> in the, um, Cre uh, Green Arrow? Green Arrow. Yeah. After, so after after uh, Kevin Smith. Oh yeah. So the question is is um, how did it feel to follow Kevin Smith on Green Arrow and then get to write the Justice League? and Identity Crisis, um, and that's basically what was my start in comics. And, and I can say this here also, my start, the reason I got into comics is because of the person sitting to my left. Because um, Judd introduced me to Bob Shrek at his wedding, and, um, and I met Bob, who was the editor at that point of Green Arrow, and later Batman, and got me involved with all those things that I did. So if you want to write comics, all you need to do is go to Judd's wedding, <laughs> is really the moral of the story. Um, but what is it like? First of all, they said to me, Kevin Smith, famous director, uh, who wrote Clerks and other things, was writing Green Arrow, was their number one comic book at the time, superhero book. And they said if he's leaving. And if he leaves, everyone's going to say, you know, if you put another comic book person in there, they're going to say, well, where's Kevin Smith? But they said if we put a novelist in there, everyone's going to go, well, what does DC know that I don't know? And the comic readers don't know you. So if we take our best book and we give it to you, people may stick around. It was a stunt. And they said you'll either... It's, a, it's our number one book, so that you'll either fail on a huge stage or you're going to succeed on a huge stage. And I was like, I, I like those odds. I'll take those odds. To me, you know, someone said to me, I got to recently throw out the first pitch at the Marlin game, and my friend immediately wrote to me, he said, why are you going to do that? They said, if it goes great, no one cares. If it goes bad, everyone says you're awful. You can't win. Why would you do that? And I was like, why would you not take a chance on yourself? Right? If, we, if you learn one thing here today, bet on yourself. Right? Judd's thing, the thing I love most about Hilo is he could still be writing comic books for DC Comics. Instead he was like, no, I quit. I was, he was working on a Batman book and said, I'm going to bet on myself. And that's why we sit here. 
And to me, I was like, I'll take that chance. But what, how does it feel to write the Justice League? When I get to write B-A-T-M-A-N and put words in Batman's mouth, I am wearing my underwear on the outside of my pants that day, <laughs> right? I am not joking, not even a bit. Like, it is awesome. I love it. I love writing Helen Keller. I love writing my thrillers. But there's nothing like knitting a little corner of that quilt that is the, the kind of amazing world of Superman, Batman, and superheroes. I, I grew up, my first book I ever can really relate to was The Justice League. So I waited my entire life to write that book. How proud do you both feel knowing how you were in college and that you both got to write for Batman and such quintessential stories of the character? How does that make you feel just thinking back to where you guys were when you first met that first day? Yeah. <laughs> Two stories. One, I'm going to do this first. So um, let's talk just real quick about publishing. We put that in quotes, this book. So m some of my clearest memories of this was um, we had to photocopy every comic strip I did, which went to Kinko's. I didn't pay for a lot of them. Uh, you could get away with it. And the other thing was, to do the book, uh, Brad had to cut out the, the, the comics, uh, the, the individual photocopies of the cartoon, and then paste them onto boards with a glue stick. And he did this while he had like his little, I'm, I'm still drawing the strip actively at my drafting table. Toby, Toby, uh, Brad set up a little. Uh, uh, that was awesome. That was <laughs> he set up a little workstation on my bed, which was high so I could put all my crap under it. And he was gluing and putting it on like high tech stuff. Seriously, that's how the book got published. Um, and I bring that up to bring this up. I remember some Saturday night, we talk about this one quite often. Uh, I'm drawing my comic strip uh, because I'm that cool. Saturday night at college, like, you know, <laughs> sophomore year, I'm in my room drawing my comic strip. And uh, Brad comes in with a piece of paper in, and actually comes in with a pad and said, okay. I said, what are you doing? He's like, I'm hanging out with you. And we're going to figure out if the Justice League and the Avengers had a fight, who would win? That's my Saturday night. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's my night of cool. Like, my son's like, I know who would win. Who would win? But who would win? Watch this. Who would win Batman versus Captain America? That's right. The answer is right. It's Batman. Batman. That is how you teach your child, people. Okay? Yes. And Have you only got an answer? And I know who that Batman versus. I'm, I mean, that Justice League versus Avengers is. You know, right. Because I, I still basically live that life. Um, and this was our life in college. And, and I think to me, the reason I was so excited to do this here tonight is because, you know what we did in college? Exactly this. It was really no different. Mike Lamont was in that room, Matt Cutler was in that room, like the people that are kind of here are still here. You know, Georgia still you know, reads the same, watches the same mash reruns, Judd does, same things. <laughs> nothing's changed, we've evolved nothing in 25 years, we've learned nothing, people, <laughs> right? We've learned nothing, if you love, so, the only thing we are proof of here is if you love something, keep doing it and just find someone to pay you to do it. Um, I married the same person I was dating then. Again, I've learned nothing, nothing at all. Um, and it worked out okay, so keep going, keep doing it. But um, to me, that was the best. I love that we got to do that then. We still do it now. We still argue over whether the Hulk is stronger. He says yes, I say no. And that's our bias, because he showed more Marvel pictures in this thing. Don't think I wasn't counting. <laughs> And I would have shown more Justice League ones. And that's where our friendship, and that's what this whole night is about, is we have these views that, um, you know, and I think Judd's presentation did it so perfectly, is, you know, who you are when you're younger is, of course, so much of who we all are today. And that's what these, my kids' books are, right? Is I show Helen Keller, or I show Amelia Earhart when she's a little kid, and I show, I don't show you when she's famous, I, I save that's fine, I care when she's seven years old and builds a homemade roller coaster in her backyard, why? Because she's still the same, who you are when you're little is exactly who you are later. These aren't the stories of famous people, especially us, it's a story of what we're all capable of in our very best days. And I saw my wife's hand go up in the back, so now I gotta ask the question or she's gonna be mad. <laughs> Uh, I just thought there was one piece of the story about your class here in Michigan. Oh, yeah, we do have to tell that. Oh. So the question was, is um, talk about our class in Michigan, the one class we took. That's actually, oh. this is when you have, this, I, I, didn't even, I should have even, that was good, thank you. Thank you. Good job. <laughs> Stay married, one more day, here we go. Um, and so Judd and I, 
the way this real I mean you were you were way ahead of me on this. There was a class in Michigan called Writing Children's Books. How did we not think to talk about this? I don't know. Because we don't prepare. No, we don't. We did not prepare. We just assume. We just assume we'll talk. Which we are. Um, and then my wife's like, tell this. I mean, is that, by the way, also the most Jewish, like, tell the story about the thing in the college. <laughs> we took this class called Writing Children's Books. And we don't take classes together. I'm in the art school. Right. Judd's in the I'm, art school. I'm, I'm, not, with I'm, a, with a, I'm, I'm an art major with a focus on drawing and painting. I'm a I, history I major. I want to be broke. Right, I mean, right. He's, yeah. he's studying art. I'm studying history. There are no two things that will make you less money in the world <laughs> than studying those two things. And so we're friends. And... The class is called Writing Children's Books, and Carolyn Balducci was a professor, and she used to, you, you'd write a children's book, and then she, you'd take it for the semester, and then she would kind of grade it, and that was the class. And Judd and I, when the class was over, you took it a different semester than I did, I don't yeah. forget who, whose idea it was, but we went to back to her and said, can we take the class again? We liked it so much. And then we said, can we take it again? And what she let us do is, she let it, she changed it, it was just the two of us in her class. And I'm not joking. This is our kind. This my parents paid like a hundred thousand dollars in Michigan to make this happen, right? God bless them. Um, and I would write a story, and then Judd would draw it. And then we said, "Can we take the class again?" And I would write a story, and Judd would draw it. Can we take the class again? I have more credits for that. I don't even know. I mean, I don't even know how I was a history major, really, because that was all I took. Um, but I will say, and I told Judd this two days ago. I was like, you know, I sent. When the first children's book came out, I sent it to Carolyn Balducci, that teacher who took that shot on us and let us do that same thing we loved over and over. I mean, how crazy that we're, I have to say it, like that we're sitting here right now. We should have invited her and flown her in. Then yeah. we would have made everyone cry. Yeah. <laughs> Screw that open heart surgery. We're fighting her next time. So um, she basically changed our lives and let us do what we dreamed and loved to do. And um, we owe her forever. And I can tell you that I, you know, these books have been reviewed. We get reviews, blah, blah, blah. I was never more terrified than when Carolyn Balducci wrote me back to tell me what she thought of these books. And until she said, you did a good job, I was, I mean, it was terror, because, right, it's your teacher. Um, so, yeah. Well, because she's, the thing is, you know, she's not really a sweetheart. <laughs> as, as much as this might seem, we're talking about this, like, wonderful woman who, oh, she gave us the, she's actually tough as nails. She was tough. And, like, uh, opening day of class? People are talking about their favorite books, and someone says, one of my favorite children's books is The Giving Tree. And Carolyn says, yeah, that's a horrible, horrible book. <laughs> <laughs> and this young woman's like, um, like, no, it's a horrible book, which is just about an abusive relationship. <laughs> and then she just spent 10 minutes just eviscerating the book, and in a way eviscerating this, you know, this 19-year-old who was Almost on the verge of tears, because she was like, she's just kind of ripping apart her childhood. So this is the woman who decided that, like, it was not so much out of the goodness of her heart, but I swear to you, she probably saw something in these nice Jewish boys who, you know, were slightly, were, were created but slightly aimless, that they just need some help. They just really, they need some help and some direction. So we one more her name is Carolyn Balducci, and we owe her everything. Okay, Jim. You want more? Yeah. Oh, we do, wait, time? Good. Okay. These yeah. two. Mr. Right Sonny is like, yeah, children. Yes. Either. Okay. Um, what is it about your job that you like the most? Oh. The question was, what is it about our jobs that we like the most? The easy answer is night lights, nights like this. So, because we get to do them very, very rarely, because a lot of what we do is that we sit in rooms by ourselves. Um, but, um, the best part for me, I'll say it again, is like I get to live like a 10-year-old. When the hard work of, of, of drawing a book, I mean of writing the book is done, then I get to draw it. I literally get to spend months drawing pictures while like listening to podcasts and music and half watching reruns of MASH. I, I, I can't even tell you how much, uh, well I'll tell you this way, for about five years I didn't draw. I was, I was writing uh, Superhero comics, I was uh, developing some live action TV. And when people asked me, what did you do? I'd say, a cartoonist. And I knew it was a lie. And when I got back to doing this, I realized that this is far beyond something that, that, that I do. This is actually who I am. And uh, so I do love it when I get to be around people like this. 
and an evening like this where I get to share time with my friends. Um, but I got to be honest with you, some most of the time I just like sitting in my room drawing. I'm very lucky. Um, I, I don't, I don't, I can't explain it. I love that kind of talking to my imaginary friends thing. I do. I just, I, I mean, the, I had this amazing moment. I was going to see my brother-in-law, and I was doing an event with him, and. I, dr I was driving through almost uh, the entrance to the Keys. This was like, four days ago, a couple nights ago. And I had this weird moment where I just had this, uh, you know, that feeling of like I've been here before that deja vu thing. And I was like, what just happened? Like, because I saw the signs as you enter when it says like, welcome to the Keys. And I realized that in the President's Shadow, um, which also goes great with a children's book, um, <laughs> in the book, I did this scene where the characters go down to the Keys. But I didn't, because of Google Maps, I didn't actually need to go. I just went on, on kind of Google Maps and went on Street View, and I looked at the signs so I could identify what the signs were at the entrance to the Keys. And I was like, I've been here before, and I was like, no, I've only really been here in my imagination. I've only been here, I've never been here, actually. And I realized in that moment that I can no longer separate reality from my own fiction, <laughs> right? I have no idea of the difference between those two things. But I love that that was so alive to me. I really was there. I've had these adventures. I've gone to the White House. I've been in the underground tunnels. I get to do these amazing things um, in my mind. And I know it sounds so silly, but that's just where, I, you know, it's, I think my social skills have atrophied, of course, yeah. but um, by not talking to people. But I love that. I love that you can just use your imagination to in entertain people, to inspire them, and to remind them of their power. That is just the core of it to me. And that, that's it. It's like that. I it's not the physical process. Writing's hard for me. It's really hard. I don't love that. But what I love is that result. What I love is being able to share that message. You know, the most pure story any of us can tell is our own story. And I love that I get to share that story on a daily basis. Okay, let's do, how, how are we doing time? Are we okay? Two more? Wait, I want to give people who didn't have a chance. Who didn't have a chance? Okay, yes. Uh, or, yes. Okay. Yeah. What's the hardest thing about drawing cartoons? What's the hardest thing about drawing cartoons? Oh, well, everyone has a different weakness. Like, I don't draw very well. I know. I know it sounds weird, but um, like, I'm lousy drawing horses. Just am. Um, so you fake it. Um, the truth is, what's great about cartoons is you do things like that. You find like, oh, I'm around to drawing horses. Let me figure out a different way of doing that. Um, I'd say. The, the hardest part is, isn't really, for me, isn't the drawing. That's the best part. The hardest part is like trying to, like, what, what's the story? What am I going to tell? I, just as Brad said, nobody likes writing. When people say, oh, I love the process of writing, they're lying to you. <laughs> they're not actually talking about writing. They're talking about editing their own stuff. They mean, like, I've already done all the heavy lifting, and now they get to pull it apart. Um, but uh, here, here's a not-so-quick story. There was a cartoonist named Dan Klaus. Um, this is like three or four years ago. This is actually this actually fits with the evening. He was on. Um, it was like four years ago. He was on NPR and he was just giving an interview, and someone asked him, "What do you love about cartooning?" And he said, "Oh, just everything." Now, mind you, I, this is part of the. I hadn't been drawing for years. I had not been a cartoonist for years. And uh, Dan Klaus was talking about being a cartoonist, and he said, "I love everything about it. I love like going to the art store and buying paper. I love uh, just getting supplies." Uh, I love measuring the borders with my rulers and all that. And I realized I was having kind of a visceral reaction. I hadn't done so long that I realized like, I'm, I, I'm almost having a panic attack. That like, yeah, I love it too. What the hell am I doing? Um, so I can't even criticize what the hardest part of cartooning is. There's no hard parts. It's all gravy. It's all good. Can I do one more question? Yes. One more. Okay, last question. One last more. question. No, no. Last one. Make yes, pressure's you. on. Pressure's on. Make it good because if it's bad, the whole night rides on you, but no pressure. <laughs> Ask your question. Um, who was the creator of the Justice League, the show? Who was the creator of the Justice League, the show? It depends which one you mean. Bruce Timm. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I would give Bruce Timm the full credit, but the Justice League is back to Gardner Fox in old days. So if you really want to nerd out, just come right up after. We're going to do that. Um, one more. We'll do one super quick question. Yes, in the back there. Yeah, good. Okay, want to do it? You hear it? Oh, uh, yeah, the question was how, how do you get the uh, the courage to actually 
I'll say just put your stories out there. Um, in my case, my mom and dad never ever gave me the idea that I couldn't do it. They never said like, that's crazy. My dad said, well, if this cartoon anything doesn't work out, you could always be an actor. Like that's his fallback. <laughs> My mother and father always felt that this is exactly what I was always going to do, and they always told me that I could always do it. And that's, that's where it started and ended. From the, I mean, honestly, when I was a little kid drawing all the time, they were the ones who said, just keep right on doing that. So um, that's where my courage comes from. Um, and for me, I just was too stubborn to know. I, got, I, I really, I got 24 rejection letters on my first book. There were only 20 publishers. I got 24 <laughs> rejection letters. And I just said, if they don't like that, I'm going to write another. And if they don't like that, I'm going to write another because... All those years ago, um, this you know 18-year-old kid walked into my dorm room and said, "I'm going to be a cartoonist." And I was like, "Well, then, you know, me too. I'll check it out." Um, so the moral of the story is, uh, again, don't learn anything. Um, go to Judd's wedding um, and see him in your dorm room. And the real moral of the story is, thank you, thank you, thank you. That is why we sit here tonight. That was crazy. Like it. Give us a moment or two so uh, Brad and Judd can get over to the other side where the signing is going to be. The books are for sale behind both counters. If you're watching online, give us a call. We'll get a book signed. Let's get another round of applause for these two guys. Huh? Thank you all so much for coming.